All right, we'll give a couple more seconds uh, for people to start coming in and then we'll get started. Yeah, people are joining in as you can see. Okay. So um, since our speaker has a, a pretty good talk here today, um, I want to make sure that he has enough time to do his talk, so we'll, we'll get going. Um, welcome to the uh, MSK Education uh, e-lecture series. We appreciate everyone tuning in and uh, passing along information about this, uh, this lecture series. Um, it's been viewed uh, so far by people around the country and around the world, and uh, you know, our goal is to get education out there in these difficult times, so thank you so much for your support. Um, just a couple of reminders before we begin. Uh, the webinar is meant for educational purposes only. There are no commercial purposes involved here. All of the interactive features for attendees have been disabled, and that is to uh, ensure optimal quality for all viewers. This includes question and answer in chat. So if you have um, any questions regarding the uh, speaker's talk, uh, please use this email address, emerymskradiology at gmail.com. We will be checking this uh, email um, during the talk. And if time permits at the end, we'll try to address as many of these questions as possible. Um, you know, we are recording some of these. This one will be recorded uh, and will be posted at a later date. Information on this will come on social media and Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, so look out for that. Um, and just a reminder, uh, personal uh, screen recording has not been uh, granted in terms of permission. This is just the speakers who are granting permission uh, in some cases. And so some of this material may be under copyright Unauthorized recording use, distribution, and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna introduce uh, our talk today, uh, and it's gonna be on acetabular fractures. The speaker is Dr. Jean Jose. Um, he is a uh, full professor of uh, radiology, orthopedic surgery, and physical medicine and rehabilitation uh, at the University of Miami. Um, he is a, uh, an excellent uh, teacher. Um, he is actually one of my mentors. Um, and uh, he uh, has won numerous um, accolades for his teaching in the residency program. He's been invited to speak um, in numerous other locations outside of the university as well um, and outside of the country. Uh, he's published over 80 peer-reviewed uh, journal articles. He's written book chapters. He's done numerous presentations uh, with trainees and himself at uh, international conferences, um, and it's a delight to have him speaking with us today. We really appreciate your time, Dr. Jose. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you right now. Good morning, thank you so very much, Adam. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and your audience uh, this morning. Um, without further ado. Do you wanna start with your questions uh, once you get your screen up, or do you wanna? Yeah, let's do it. I'll let you take control of the screen and then we'll put up. We're gonna try something new here today just as a lead in. We have a couple of uh, interactive questions here and we're gonna start with these and, um, and then we'll uh, move to the talk. So we'll start with question one and um, everybody should uh, see this question up. Um, if you wanna take a sec and uh, go ahead and get your votes in and uh, then we'll post it a little bit. We'll give about uh, 20 seconds or so. The question and answers are coming in right now. they're starting to trickle in here. So we're gonna stop at this point and just kind of show the results here. And so these are the results going into it. So that is question one. And I'm gonna go to question two here, if we can. There we go. Question two, 
and we're getting close to that point here. We still got a bunch of votes coming in, but just for the sake of moving forward, we're gonna end it here. And so the results from question two. All right, and with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Jose. Okay, thank you very much. So we will be discussing uh, imaging of acetabular fractures. I have no disclosures. So in the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to be going over as much as we can regarding acetabular fractures from very basic anatomy all the way up to long and short-term complications. So we'll start by discussing the anatomy and the different imaging modalities that we use to evaluate acetabular fractures. We'll obviously discuss the Judea and Letourneau classification of acetabular fractures, which has been around for a very, very long time, um, but it's still relatively challenging. Uh, I find it challenging to uh, appropriately classify acetabular fractures, uh, and, and so it's, it's always a helpful review. And then obviously we'll end with the with the complications. So some basic considerations. Uh, they tend to be pretty bad injuries because they combine uh, young adults, particularly in Southern Florida. So young adults engaging in reckless activities, whether it's um, a motor vehicle accident or a high velocity fall. So it's usually the result of high energy trauma. For our athletes, obviously football is paramount. Uh, we routinely, uh, have these uh, football players presenting with hip pain. And we've had, in my 12 years at UM, a couple of our Division I athletes uh, have actual uh, posterior wall fractures with uh, cartilage shear injuries. Um, our older osteoporotic patients uh, will have acetabular fractures as a result of low energy trauma. And one of our dilemmas is how to manage them. And, and the surgical management for an older osteoporotic patient uh, may be that even if the acetabular fracture is displaced, the surgeons may opt to wait um, and have whatever uh, fragments uh, heal, even if they are healed in incongruity, because eventually they may just opt to have uh, joint replacement. While our younger patients, obviously, they're going to try to preserve the joint uh, and they'll be more aggressive in terms of the open reduction internal fixation. Um, unfortunately, they, as a result of high energy trauma, polytrauma, they're associated with other uh, life-threatening injuries that, that take precedence. And so a lot of times they'll be placed into some sort of traction um, to try to reduce the, the, the joint. And then once the other comorbidities are, are addressed, uh, then they'll, they'll, they'll go for surgery on the hip. Um, when you look at the literature in terms of the incidence in the adults, it's been reported as high as 24% of all uh, pelvic fractures, specifically acetabular fractures. In the pediatric uh, literature, it's up to 10% of all pediatric pelvic injuries. And if you look at level one trauma centers, uh, the admission rates for acetabular fractures is high. It can be as high as 7.5%. Uh, Obviously, the main issue with acetabular fractures that differentiates it from other pelvic injuries is the potential for articular incongruity of the hip joint, and that results in abnormal pressure distribution that can lead to the rapid breakdown of articular cartilage and disabling post-traumatic arthritis in a relatively young patient. As we all know, they are uh, the result of a pretty complex uh, injury patterns, whether it's dashboard injuries or direct side impacts. So they, they will have a lot of associated skeletal injuries. Uh, you'll have femoral head and neck fractures. Particularly interesting are the femoral head fractures, the so-called Pipkin fractures. And so you may have a patient that presents with a isolated uh, femoral head fracture that, that, that's picked up on an x-ray. And so we need to understand that the mechanism of injury usually implies that there will be a concomitant acetabular injury as well. You can obviously have a hip dislocation, most commonly a posterior hip dislocation, uh, that then you have to worry about other problems, right? So in the setting of a posterior hip dislocation, you worry about a sciatic uh, nerve injury, particularly the perineal division. So they'll clinically present with a foot drop in the setting of an anterior wall or an anterior column injury, you worry about uh, femoral neurovascular injury. And then anywhere where the femoral head gets migrated immediately, you worry about an obturator. So you have concomitant pelvic fractures, obviously patellar fractures. And if it's a dashboard type injury, you worry obviously about a PCL injury. And then again, 
a tibial neurovascular injury at the level of the knee. And as I mentioned, sciatic nerve injury is the most common injury of nerve regarding acetabular fractures that we see in our practice. It's been reported up to 38%. Um, and again, it's the perineal division, obviously. So the mechanism of injury most commonly is transmission of force through the femoral shaft. So the positioning of the femoral head at the time of impact is key to the type of acetabular fracture that you will be uh, faced. So whether the en energy comes through the shaft, uh, from the knee or the foot, or from the side through the area of the greater trochanter, again, that femoral head is the last link of the chain. So the position of the femur at the time of impact and the direction of the force will determine the type of acetabular fracture that you're facing. I tend to think of the the femur and the femoral head as a hammer that kind of breaks the acetabulum. So that when the femoral head is rotated internally like this, the force is transferred to the posterior aspect of the acetabulum. So you're gonna be dealing with posterior column and posterior wall fractures. When the femoral head is rotated externally, the force is directed to the anterior column. When the femoral head is adducted, the, form, uh, the force is transmitted to the acetabular roof. And when the femoral head is abducted, the, the force is transmitted inferiorly towards the medial aspect of the acetabulum. So again, posterior sciatic, anterior femoral, medial obturator. If the hip is flexed at the time of injury, the, the force is transmitted posteriorly. If the femur is hyperextended, the force is transmitted anteriorly. Obviously, this is the anterior subluxations and dislocations and the isolated anterior wall fractures are going to become exceedingly rare uh, when you look at the overall uh, classification and incidence of the different types of acetabular fractures. In the pediatric population, it can be challenging to pick up these subtle fractures, obviously because of the triradiate cartilage. Um, so we always scrutinize these and try to obtain MRs when we are suspecting uh, acetabular fractures in kids. Again, that quadrilateral plate is the medial wall of the acetabulum, and the dome of the acetabulum is the superior aspect that carries most of the weight-bearing forces. When we look at the mature adult pelvis, remember that the acetabulum, the, uh, the articular surface of the acetabulum is that inverted horseshoe, and that center portion uh, known as the acetabular fossa or the cotyloid fossa uh, is a common location for displaced intraarticular fragments. And one of the reasons why we obtain CAT scans, both uh, preoperatively and postoperatively in these patients, or pre-reduction and post-reduction if there's a concomitant dislocation, is to look for displaced trapped intraarticular fragments. And so routinely, we tend to see these trapped intraarticular fragments residing within the acetabular fossa. So we start off in our practice with our trauma uh, x-rays, and then we quickly progress to uh, CT. We try to obtain the CT once the femoral head has been reduced. And so whether the femoral head spontaneously reduces on the field, which is most commonly the, 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 the case, or if they present to the ER with a dislocated uh, femoral head, we try not to obtain the CAT scan with the, with the femoral head displaced because the longer amount of time that that femoral head displaced, we know from the literature there is a higher incidence of concomitant uh, long-term uh, complications, such as osteonecrosis of the femoral head um, and neurovascular injury. So the orthopedic surgeons, the trauma surgeons, know to reduce that femoral head as quickly as possible, so, but, but, so we don't like to see on CT that femoral head be out. So we use CT to clarify the fracture patterns. Uh, we obviously look for articular surface congruity and incongruity, those trapped intraarticular fragments, again, mostly within that cotyloid or acetabular fossa. And again, we identify marginal impaction fractures. Um, so concomitant injuries beyond just the acetabulum, whether we're dealing with the femoral head and neck. And I'll show you examples how that surgically manages different, uh, they're managed differently. We reserve MRI beyond the pediatric population to look for cartilage and soft tissue injuries. Um, and then obviously, if we're getting the MRI, we, we, we also try to do some sort of neurovascular injury. Again, looking for nerve injury, but also remember that there is a higher incidence of DVT, so we can do uh, MR venography of the pelvis to look for thrombus within the uh, iliac vessels. And then finally, DVT for the lower extremity uh, dopplers. So when you do the basic x-ray evaluation, uh, those plain films should include an AP view of the pelvis. Uh, and if you look for the six basic lines on an AP view of the pelvis, you'll, you'll obtain your diagnosis about 90% of the time. We do an AP view of the affected hip, 
mainly to look at that femoral head neck region. And then obviously we obtain the Jude views to evaluate the columns and walls. Remember that the Jude view will be named to the side of injury. Uh, and uh, we will obtain the Jude view at that 45 degree oblique by placing a wedge on the patient. So we don't try to tilt the tube because that creates radiographic distortion. So here's that basic frontal view of the pelvis and of the hip, and these are the six basic lines. Obviously, the most lateral wall will be the posterior wall in the majority of patients. Uh, remember that in the setting of acetabular retroversion, similar to what we see in pincer type FAI, that wall, that posterior wall may, more, may be more medially displaced, but in the vast majority of patients, the larger and lateral wall should be the posterior wall. The anterior wall will be the smaller and the more medial wall. Obviously, the roof, also known as the dorm or the sorso, will be the, the other wall. We have the acetabular teardrop, which we know is not a real anatomic landmark, but a radiographic landmark created by a confluence of, of structures. But we use the, the acetabular teardrop to look for discrepancies in subluxation of the femoral head. So I use that to see the degree of subluxation or the positioning of the femoral head with regards to the acetabulum. We also evaluate the ilioischial line, which is the domain of the posterior column, and the iliopectineal line, which will be the domain mainly of the anterior column. So here are the six lines uh, as, I as I described them. When you look at the lateral projections of the acetabulum and you think of what encompasses the uh, anterior column, remember that it travels from the, the iliac wing, let's say, all the way down uh, to the anterior ramus. And so the iliopectineal line will be involved. The posterior column goes from the sciatic notch, encompasses uh, the ischial tuberosity all the way down on uh, the posterior. And again, anterior and posterior columns will affect the obturator foramen or the obturator ring. And so that's one of the landmarks that we're going to be using when we're classifying based on Judea Lettermo. Obviously, an anterior wall, which is extremely rare, an isolated anterior wall fracture, but again, it will be confined to that anterior rim, and then the way more common posterior wall will be a, uh, the, the, uh, the isolated posterior rim. The, both the anterior and posterior columns will be uh, in that supraacetabular region. They'll be uh, brought together uh, in that uh, their appearance is that of an inverted Y, also known as the Greek uh, lambda. And, and where they join, there is a connection between the columns with the axial skeleton, and that's the so-called sciatic buttress. And we use a sciatic buttress because if we see a fracture involving the sciatic buttress and the displaced fracture fragments, we know, we know that as a spur sign, and that's indicative of a both column fracture. And I'll show you some examples of that. So again, that anterior column tends to be the larger of the two columns. And it, again, it encompasses the iliac wing all the way down to the superior ramus. The posterior column will begin at the sciatic notch and travel all the way posteriorly to the ischium. And here is that location of that sciatic buttress connecting the acetabulum to the sacroiliac joint and the remainder of the axial skeleton. So if you think of the iliopectineal line, which is mostly known as the domain of the anterior column, you can have different fracture patterns affecting the iliopectineal line and theoretically disrupting the anterior column. But for our classification system, as you'll see in a, uh, in a few minutes when I show you some examples, we have to be mindful as to where, it, where that iliopectineal line is disrupted. In terms of the ilioischial line, again, uh, it is the domain of the posterior column, but you can also have disruption of the ischial line in, in an anterior column injury as well. So here are the different types or the main uh, fracture lines that you can get through this. Obviously, there's going to be comminution involved as I'll see in a second. So when we look at the Jude views, again, they're named relative to the side of the acetabular fracture. Um, the patient must be moved to the oblique position, uh, mostly by placing a wedge. So you don't move the radiographic tube because that leads to distortion. And it, it, in order to, to determine whether or not you've obtained a good 45 degree oblique, you should use the coccyx because the coccyx should project over the femoral head. And so that's a good uh, cheat way of, of seeing if that acid, if that position is adequate. So here's an example of a of an obturator oblique. In this case, the site of injury is the left hip. So you've placed a 45 degree wedge under the the affected hip. And so in this view, you'll see the obturator foramen on on FOS, also known as the obturator ring. Uh, and you'll get the anterior column on profile. Again, you're following that iliopectineal line, and you see the posterior wall on profile. 
When you place the wedge on the other hip, on the contralateral hip, you've created the iliac ob uh, oblique. Uh, and in this particular uh, view, you get a nice uh, access to the sciatic notch, so that ilioischial line, the domain of the posterior column, uh, and you also have a view of the anterior wall. On CT, again, it's very helpful in characterizing fracture patterns. You allow the detection of subtle fractures and displacements that you cannot appreciate radiographically. Obviously, you're looking for displacement of intraarticular bodies, concomitant femoral head and neck injuries. Uh, our surgeons uh, demand the 3D uh, surface renderings to help conceptualize the fracture patterns and, and plan their surgeries. Uh, this is a very helpful, this has been in the literature for, for, for a while now, but obviously a lot of these fractures are going to be commented and displaced, so it's, it helps when you're looking at it in the axial plane to, to try to determine the dominant fracture pattern. So if, that, if the dominant fracture uh, pattern is in a horizontal uh, direction like this, uh, it's usually going to be a column fracture. If the dominant uh, fracture pattern, regardless of comminution, but if the dominant fracture pattern is transverse or vertical like this, then you're dealing with a transverse fracture, and then your isolated anterior and posterior walls are just going to affect the anterior and posterior rims of the acetabulum. Again, MR, I, I mentioned the indications uh, of MR in our practice. This is uh, a younger patient that had an isolated anterior wall uh, fracture from a hyperextension injury, and you can see the comminuted injury to the femoral neurovascular bundle. We like proton density imaging uh, with moderate, uh, so that intermediate TE rather than T1 because we can see the degree of articular cartilage. Uh, if we look at uh, the Jude and Letourneau classification, again, it's been uh, around for, for quite some time. It was based on cadaveric dissection and radiography with lead markers, and then uh, Jude's initial work was further uh, modified by Letourneau. So if you look, and this pertains to the first question of the lecture, if you look at the classification, it's based on that lateral view of the acetabulum, and they identified 10 basic uh, patterns of acetabular fractures, and they are grouped into two categories. Five are simple or elementary, and five are complex or associated. So if you look at these simple or elementary patterns, they basically have a single fracture orientation, and those include the very rare anterior wall, the very common posterior wall, uh, the anterior column, the posterior column, and the transverse fracture. So those are the simple elementary patterns according to the Jude and Letourneau classification. The associated patterns combine features of elementary uh, fractures, and so those include the both column fracture, which is pretty common, the posterior column with posterior wall fractures, the transverse fractures with posterior wall, the T-shaped fractures, and then probably the most challenging uh, which is the anterior column fracture with posterior hemitransverse. And we're going to go through them over the next 20 minutes or so, and hopefully at the end of the lecture, this will become less complicated to identify. This was published a few years ago. When you look at the literature in terms of which is the most common, there is some variation there. As I mentioned, posterior wall fractures in isolation or in combination with other type of acetabular fractures tend to be very commonly seen. They are the most common that we see in our practice. There is some literature talking about the uh, both column fracture being the most common overall. Uh, but regardless, if you look uh, in terms of broad categories, and if you remember the first three, which is the both column fracture, the posterior wall, and the transverse posterior wall, these tend to be overall the most common when compared to the uh, isolated anterior column or anterior wall or posterior column fractures, which will have a lower frequency. So again, grouping together the five most common, both, col uh, both column transverse with posterior wall, posterior wall and T-shape, uh, as opposed to the uh, uncommon acetabular fractures. So if you remember anything, remember the first five. So going from order, uh, this is what you're dealing with. But for simplicity, I tend to think of these fractures uh, into three categories, whether they involve a wall, a column, or if we're dealing with a transverse fracture. So some fractures fit into two of these categories. So uh, wall fractures are obviously going to be the anterior and posterior wall, the posterior column with posterior wall, and the transverse with posterior wall. And then the column fractures are going to be the anterior or posterior column, the both column, the posterior column with posterior wall, uh, and the anterior column, posterior hemitransverse. And then finally, the transverse fractures are going to be your transverse fracture, your T-shaped fractures, your transverse fracture with posterior wall, 
and your anterior column with posterior hemitransfer. I know that this is very, very dense, um, but let's try to break them down according to these three basic groups uh, uh, and, and go through them. So let's start off with the wall fractures, and let's start off with the rarest, probably the isolated anterior wall fracture. Um, so it's an isolated anterior wall fractures. They usually do not involve the weight-bearing uh, articular portion of the acetabulum. And if they're isolated to the anterior of the acetabulum, and there is no significant impingement of the overlying femoral nerve astral bundle, uh, oftentimes these will not be surgically addressed. I've had a few cases where that isolated anterior wall fracture will become displaced and trapped between the iliopsoas tendon so that there is interposition of the iliopsoas tendon uh, if, if, it's, if it's an extended fracture, and that may, that may necessitate uh, open reduction internal fixation. But by and large, these isolated anterior wall fractures are usually not addressed surgically um, at time of presentation. And again, it implies an anterior dislocation of the femoral head. So here's an example. Uh, I, I've shown you the MR in this patient. If you look at the AP and the ob uh, oblique on the AP, you have preservation of the iliopectineal and ilioischial lines. And on that right iliac oblique, you can see the disruption of that anterior wall. Posterior wall fractures are, are way more common than those of the uh, anterior wall. They may occur in isolation or again, in combination with posterior column or transverse type fractures. And so here's your classic posterior wall fracture. When you look at your uh, Jude views, you have preservation of the iliopectineal and ilioischial lines. On that frontal uh, AP view, you can see that the most lateral wall is disrupted. These tend to be the ones that we most commonly miss in clinical practice. Uh, the ones that I've seen in my football players that will not present to the ER, but instead they'll present to the sports medicine clinic after practice or after a game with hip pain. It's usually going to be a very small posterior rim fracture that has been uh, that, that, that wasn't detected, um, and so if you, if you can understand why, okay. Uh, again, uh, in, in our patient population, uh, these posterior rim fractures, what I tend to see a lot in my football players is that they'll transiently posteriorly sublocate or dislocate, and you'll have concomitant cartilage shear injuries. So you'll have disruption of articular cartilage, usually in parafoveal margins of the femoral head, um, so we will obtain MRs looking for that articular cartilage injury. And when I see that chondral shear, the full thickness cartilage shear injury of the femoral head in parafoveal margins, I know that the patient has had a transient posterior subluxation, um, whether or not I see the concomitant posterior wall fracture or a posterior labral fracture. So usually that's the mechanism that I see. Here's an example of a pediatric posterior wall fracture. Again, the, the, the challenging thing here is the triradiate cartilage and trying to determine whether the, the obvious uh, posterior wall fracture will involve it or not. You can see that there is persistent posterior subluxation uh, of that femoral head. And here is the, the CAT scan. As I mentioned earlier, we reserve MR on these patients, again, to see extent of the fracture, to see if the triradiate cartilage in the medial wall of the acetabula has been injured. In this case, it was spared. So this is an isolated posterior wall fracture. And again, the orthopedic and trauma uh, residents and fellows, uh, they know to check for a concomitant foot drop. Obviously, the, the fat planes around the sciatic nerve have been obliterated. So here's another example of a displaced posterior wall fracture. Again, you have preservation of the ilioischial and iliopectineal line, but you can see that there is disruption. This is that so-called um, goal wing uh, or goal uh, sign that we talk about. So the gold wing sign, it was described in the, in the 1960s by uh, Berkebile. And again, it, it describes the appearance of a posterior fracture dislocation of the hip on uh, mostly on the lateral view. And again, that posterior displaced fragment of the acetabulum combined with the rest of the acetabulum to create that double uh, contour sign uh, of that, uh, the gold wing. Uh, gold wing has also been assigned to immediately displaced fracture of the acetabular roof where the immediately displaced fragment of the acetabulum and the lateral part together form that, uh, that seagull appearance. But again, this is that classic uh, uh, goal win that we were referencing. Uh, literature also describes an extended posterior wall fractures. These tend to be a little bit more uh, complex because of the fact that you may have disruption of the ilioischial line. So we routinely teach our residents that if you have preservation of the ilioischial and iliopectineal uh, lines with disruption of that uh, lateral or isolated posterior wall, that will be a po simple posterior wall fracture. But the literature does describe this extended posterior wall fracture where you have 
extension of that posterior wall to involve the sciatic notch or the quadrilateral pace. And that's, again, disruption of the ilioischial line, as in this case. Uh, and so this fracture can resemble a posterior column fracture. And we teach our residents to distinguish this because in the extended posterior wall fracture, the obturator ring will be intact. However, the ilioischial line will be disrupted. However, if you have a posterior column fracture, the ilioischial line will be disrupted, but also the obturator ring will be disrupted. So in, again, in this case, this is just an extended posterior wall fracture where you have preservation of the uh, obturator ring with disruption of the uh, ilioischial line. Here's another example. In this case, the patient presented to the ER with the, that posterior hip dislocation and the concomitant fracture. Uh, and this is something that we don't like to do, which is a CT with that femoral head out of place. Uh, unfortunately, they, they, they couldn't reduce it. They couldn't do a closed reduction on this. And they did the CAT scan to see what the impediment to the closed reduction uh, was. And so in this, in this case, you can see that femoral head being um, posteriorly displaced and you can see the non-displaced posterior wall fracture. So they then placed the patient under anesthesia and did a closed reduction and we repeated the CAT scan. And you can see uh, that femoral head now being appropriately located within the acetabulum. And again, the reason to obtain this CAT scan immediately after the closed reduction under anesthesia was to make sure that that uh, posterior wall fracture fragment had not been displaced intraarticularly. Other reasons for that, is to look for that concomitant femoral head neck fracture. So here's an unfortunate case of a patient that had a posterior wall fracture following a posterior hip dislocation. Uh, they reduced, they actually put a plate and screws, but again, uh, there was a, a trapped intraarticular fragment that should have been uh, removed at the time of surgery. Here's another example. This is a uh, posterior wall fracture with a posterior dislocation. Again, a very large posterior wall uh, fracture fragment, but the key here is not to only identify the displaced uh, posterior wall fragment, but again, the fact that there is a trapped intraarticular fragment that can be seen uh, radiographically. And here's the same patient CT. You can see that trapped intraarticular fragment, uh, again, following the closed reduction. Here's another example of a patient, uh, posterior dislocation, and this is after reduction. Again, you can see this very subtle a trapped intraarticular fragment, but it becomes critical, obviously, to, to identify these as quickly as possible. And here is the patient's CAT scan showing that trapped intraarticular fragment. And then one more uh, dislocation. And now in this case, we identified the fragment that was projecting within the within the, uh, the joint space, but that in this case, the fracture fragment did not originate from the acetabulum, but instead from the femoral head. So this is that so-called Pipkin fracture. In this case, the femoral head still remains uh, dislocated posteriorly, and these fracture fragments are from the femoral head. And this is post-reduction. Uh, you can see that the congruity of that femoral head has been restored. So there is both an acetabular fracture and a femoral head uh, fracture as well. And so these are the Pipkin fractures. They imply a traumatic dislocation of the hip with concomitant acetabulum and femoral head fractures, initially described in the 1950s, and Pipkin uh, described four main types uh, depending on where that femoral head fracture uh, followed with regards to the phobia. So the type ones are femoral head fractures that are distal to the phobia. The type two are fractures that are proximal to the phobia. The type three is a type one or a type two with an associated femoral neck fracture. And then finally, the type four is a type one or two with an associated acetabular rim fracture. So not all femoral fractures uh, associated with acetabular fractures are Pipkin. Sometimes the femoral neck uh, can fracture as well, and it can be very, very subtle. So let me show you an example of that. So here's a patient with an obvious acetabular fracture. Um, what is very difficult to see on that frontal view is that subtle cortical impaction of the femoral neck. The patient underwent CT. Again, the acetabular fracture was described, uh, but it, unfortunately, uh, this was not, which was the impaction of the femoral neck. Uh, and you can see the indentation. And so why is this important? Because it's gonna change the surgical management. The surgeon will not only address the displaced acetabular fracture, but also has to reinforce the femoral neck to prevent the femoral neck fracture from completing. So in this particular case, uh, we did the MR, uh, we, we showed the, con the concomitant uh, cortical impaction fracture of the femoral neck. And this is how this patient was surgically treated. They did a open reduction internal fixation of the acetabular fracture. 
and prophylactic uh, surgical screws through the impacted femoral neck, again, to prevent completion. Moving on to the column fractures. Again, column fractures divide the acetabulum into front and back halves, so that coronal plane, which is why on the axial CT you see that dominant fracture line tra traversing in a kind of like a horizontal plane. So you have that anterior and posterior column, the both, both column, the posterior column with posterior wall, and then the anterior column uh, with posterior hemitransverse. This is from Durkee's article. It's been referenced numerous times, but it's very, very helpful. Again, when you have these uh, acetabular fractures that are complex, you want to look for the obturator ring to see if there's disruption. If there is disruption, then the next question is, does the fracture extend into the iliac wing? Because it, if it is, you're most likely dealing with a both column fracture. If there is disruption of the obturator ring, but the uh, iliac wing is not affected, then it's mostly a T-shaped fracture. If the obturator ring is spared, then you look for ilioischial and iliopectineal line disruption. If there are, is there a concomitant wall, posterior wall fracture? Uh, if there is, then you're dealing with a transverse posterior wall. If there isn't, then it's a pure transverse fracture. And then finally, if the ischial and iliopectineal lines are preserved, and uh, if there is a posterior wall fracture, then obviously you're dealing with an isolated posterior wall fracture. This is very, very helpful. Uh, and so let's go through this again. Here's that anterior column. Um, and so here are some examples of that anterior column fracture, both on the frontal and on your Jude views, you're going to see disruption of the iliopectineal line. Again, remember that certain type of, of anterior column fractures may also disrupt the ilio uh, ischial line as well, based on that diagram I showed you earlier. But again, mostly you're going to see disruption of that iliopectineal line. So here it is again, uh, both on the CT and on the 3D rendering, that there is disruption of that iliopectineal line with relative preservation of the ischial line. Uh, posterior column fracture will disrupt the ischial line uh, but we'll spare the iliopectineal line. So you should not see iliopectineal line disruption in an isolated posterior column fracture. And so there are the different examples. Uh, and so here it is on the Jude views, uh, disruption of the uh, ilioischial line and of the obturator ring. And again, <clears throat> based on the, 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 what we discussed earlier, that regardless of the degree of comminution, if the main fracture lines are in the horizontal plane, you, you know that you're splitting that acetabulum uh, in that coronal plane, so you're dealing with a column fracture. Both column fractures are very, very common. Again, both the anterior and posterior columns are going to be involved, so you're going to have disruption of the ischio and iliopectineal lines. And so there is overlap between a both column fracture, a transverse fracture, and a T-shaped fracture. So, so what can you use to distinguish them? Okay, so if you have disruption of the ischio and iliopectineal line, it can happen in, all, in any of the three types. However, if you have involvement of the obturator ring, you can see that with a both column fracture and a T-shaped fracture, but not in a transverse fracture. If you have involvement of the iliac wing, that, that's usually uh, the domain of a both column fracture, but that's usually not seen in a transverse fracture or a T-shaped fracture. And then you look for that spur sign, which again should be absent in both the transverse fracture and a T-shaped fracture. So again, in all three patterns, both column fractures, transverse fractures, and T-shaped fractures, you may see disruption of the ilioischial and iliopectineal lines, but then you use the obturator ring, you use your iliac wing, and you use the appearance of the spur sign to help tease them out. So here's an example uh, where you have the ilioischial and iliopectineal lines are disrupted. You can see that there is disruption of the obturator ring, and you notice that the iliac wing is also fractured above the level of the acetabulum. So again, remember that that iliac wing is part of the anterior column, so this is your both column fracture. And here's that spur sign. Um, it's that sciatic uh, buttress that we were talking about earlier. It's best seen on the uh, obturator oblique of the affected hip. You can see that that bony strut is, dis uh, is displaced. Again, it's that connection of those columns with the sacroiliac joint and the remainder of the uh, axial skeleton. So again, that spur sign is indicative of a both column fracture, and you should not see that in a transverse or T-shaped fracture. So more examples uh, on CT of both column fractures. And here is a po posterior column with a posterior wall fracture. Again, you'll have disruption of that ischial line, and you'll have interruption of that posterior rim. That's pretty straightforward. So more examples of that posterior wall and posterior column uh, fractures there. Now, the transverse type fractures, those are probably the most challenging ones to pick up. Uh, again, uh, they're named by their appearance when the acetabulum examined from the lateral view. Uh, 
they divide the acetabulum into a top and bottom half. So therefore, the dominant fracture line on an axial CT will be vertical. The force is usually directed towards the medial wall of the acetabulum. And in these transverse type fractures, both the iliopectineal and ilioischial lines will be uh, interrupted. But the obturator ring uh, and iliac wing are usually spared, and that spur sign will not be present. So that is what distinguishes these from the both column fractures. So these are the types of transverse fractures. You have your pure transverse fracture, your T-shaped, your transverse with posterior wall, and the anterior column with posterior hemitransverse. So let's go through them. So the pure transverse fracture, uh, Literno further subclassified transverse fractures into transtectal, juxtatectal, and infratectal. And what he meant was in which the, the transverse fracture line crossed superior at the junction uh, or inferior to that acetabular articular surface. And so again, you subclassify transverse fractures based on their relationship to that articular cartilage of the inverted horseshoe. So here's that classic transverse fracture uh, on your radiographs where you have interruption of the iliopectineal and ilioischial lines, but notice that the obturator ring and the iliac wing are spared, and obviously you do not have that spur sign. And again, as I mentioned, because it divides that acetabulum into uh, upper and bottom halves, the dominant fracture lines on an axial CT in that supraacetabular region is going to be vertical. That's classic for these transverse type fractures. Here's another example of a transverse fracture. Again, uh, it affects both the ilioischial and iliopectineal lines, but spares the iliac wing and the obturator ring, and there is no spur sign. Here's a displaced transverse fracture, similar concept, but there's displacement of fracture fragments. And these tend to be very subtle. In this case, this was missed. This is an older osteoporotic patient with a low energy trauma. They were just having hip pain. There was no history of high energy trauma. And so initially this was missed. It's a very subtle uh, fracture, but a CAT scan was done where we could see it. It was non-displaced. And then finally the MRI was done as well uh, that showed uh, the non-displaced fracture. This patient obviously was treated conservatively and did fine. Posterior transverse, uh, excuse me, transverse fractures with posterior wall fractures, they're relatively common. It incorporates features of both the transverse and posterior wall fractures. So here it is. When you see comminution extending into that posterior wall region, then that's the transverse posterior wall fracture. And again, you have disruption of the ilioischial and iliopectineal lines, but you have sparing of the iliac wing and of the obturator ring. So here it is. And again, the dominant uh, fracture lines will be vertical. The T-shaped fracture, uh, is, is, it can be challenging, uh, but, but it shouldn't be because all that you're dealing here with is you have relative preservation of the iliac wing. You will have disruption of the uh, iliopectineal and, and ilioischial line. But in addition to that, you'll have a vertical fracture, that, a component that goes through the obturator ring. So it will disrupt the ilioischial and iliopectineal line, similar to what you see in a both column fracture and in a transverse fracture. You will have disruption of the obturator ring, similar to a both column fracture, but different from that of a transverse fracture. Uh, the, the thing that distinguishes this fracture from a column fracture is the fact that it does not involve the iliac wing and you should not see a sciatic buttress uh, or the spur sign. You should not see that. So here's the T-shaped the fracture again. This, it's a displaced T-shaped fracture. There's disruption of the ilioischial and iliopectineal line. But in addition to that, you have that vertical fracture component extending into the obturator ring. Again, the iliac wing is spared, and you do not see this first sign. And here is down on the 3D. The anterior column posterior hemitransverse, that probably is the most challenging one to, to diagnose on imaging. It combines features of column fractures and transverse fractures, so it may be difficult to appreciate radiographically. So you're going to see both main fracture fragment uh, components, both uh, horizontal and vertical. Um, so here it is. So the fracture extends above the level of the acetabulum and into the ilium. So it is characteristic of an anterior column fracture. In addition, there is a transverse component that extends front to back through the acetabulum. So you'll have in the anterior column with posterior hemitransverse, you're going to have disruption of the iliopectineal line the ilioischial line will be preserved, the obturator ring will be interrupted, and the iliac wing will be affected. 
And so here is the, all of the components. Again, the main thing here is that to distinguish this from a both column fracture is going to be the fact that the ilioistial line should be preserved. And so here is that anterior column with posterior hemitransverse acetabular fracture. So again, use the obturator ring, the iliac wing, uh, and the disruption of the uh, ilioischial and iliopectineal line, similar to what Durkee taught us, to help characterize uh, these type of fractures. Now, we'll, we'll end the lecture with the complications. Uh, obviously, you have immediate uh, post-traumatic, immediate post-surgical, and then the dreaded long-term complications. So the immediate Post-traumatic complications are going to mostly involve neurovascular injury. We mentioned injury to the sciatic and femoral nerves. Uh, you have obturator nerves and also uh, superior gluteal nerves. The obturator nerve, uh, again, will be more when that femoral head is pointed medially and you'll have concomitant uh, fractures of the superior and inferior pubic rami. The immediate post-surgical complications beyond nerve injuries are going to be wound infections and DVT, which is the most common vascular event. And then the late complications, which we'll routinely see in our clinical outpatient setting, is going to be heterotopic ossification, uh, osteonecrosis. Uh, again, that osteonecrosis is going to be directly proportional to the amount of time that the femoral head remained outside of the socket, and also the presence of concomitant femoral head fractures. Obviously, intraarticular displaced fracture fragments are important. Uh, incongruity of the articular surface is going to lead to con uh, chondrolysis and post-traumatic osteoarthritis with chronic instability. So when you look at the literature in terms of neurological complications, sciatic nerve injury with the initial trauma is reported up to 31%. Again, the perineal nerve division is the most sensitive and they'll clinically present with the foot, foot drop. Most oftentimes it's a traction type of injury to the nerve, so they can resolve spontaneously without neurolysis. Iatrogenic neurologic injury, again, the sciatic and perineal nerve is the most common reported rates uh, all, are all over the, uh, the literature. Letourneau reported up to 6%, but it has been reported up to 16%. Obviously, when they do a posterior approach to reduce a posterior column or an extended posterior wall fracture, there's a higher risk there. Uh, DVT, the literature is a little bit all over the place, uh, anywhere from 21 to 70%. Beyond just the lower extremities, you have to worry about the pelvic veins. As I mentioned earlier, that is one of our indications for MRI of the pelvis that we'll do an MRV looking for thrombus within an iliac vessel, and of course, death from PE associated from, with acetabular fractures. Uh, in, again, it's variable in the literature depending on where in the world you're dealing with, but it's been reported up to 4%. 4 Other dreaded complications post-surgical are poor hardware placement. It can be quite challenging to identify these radiographically. In this case, this is one where, unfortunately, one of the surgical screws violated uh, the articular uh, uh, surface and extended into the joint space. This patient obviously postoperatively was experiencing pain with movement, and you can see one of the surgical screws extending into the, the articular surface. Here's a, and there it is. Uh, and so here it is on the uh, axials. Uh, concomitant injury, the so called Morel Lavallee lesion. This is something we published a few years ago. You're all familiar with this. This is the the degloving injury occurring at the interface of the deep fat and the muscles, classically in the trochanteric region, although it's been described in lower spine, around the knee, and elsewhere in the thigh. So here is the moral lavalle uh, lesion. The more common ones of the late are going to be your heterotopic ossification, your AVN, and obviously your post-traumatic arthritis. So when you look at heterotopic ossification, a couple of, uh, of pearls. One, that, it, that the, the surgical approach, when they decide to do open reduction internal fixation, uh, depending on the approach, that will affect uh, the incidence of heterotopic ossification. So if you have a combined anterior to posterior approach, they'll have probably the highest uh, risk for heterotopic ossification. Um, the ilioinguinal approach has been described as the least uh, risk. Other concomitant uh, risk factors for the development of heterotopic ossification, so concomitant head injury, which unfortunately we tend to see with acetabular fractures in these young uh, male patients that are undergoing high energy trauma from motor vehicle collisions. So again, head injury, male, and the fracture types are all associated with heterotopic ossification. Uh, we've tried different things to, to uh, prevent the development of heterotopic ossification. So things such as placing them on NSAIDs, uh, uh, they've even tried um, radiation uh, therapy, again, to prevent uh, we, we do put them on NSAID prophylactic at our institution. We do not employ radiation. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, we're all familiar with the Broca classification, again, based on the x-rays from zero to four uh, for the degree of heterotopic classification. So let me show you some examples. This is immediate post-op. This is a 24-year-old immediate post-op, so obviously high energy trauma because beyond the pelvic and acetabular fractures, there was also a femoral shaft fracture uh, and unfortunately developed extensive heterotopic ossification six months after surgery. Uh, here's another patient. This is a two-month follow-up. You can see the bridging heterotopic ossification in this young patient. Here's another one. In this case, both the hardware and the heterotopic ossification impinged on the femoral neck. And this was a, a bigger case because it required also prophylactic uh, revision uh, to reinforce that femoral neck because the impingement of the heterotopic ossification and the hardware uh, placed the patient at increased risk for displaced femoral neck fracture. And obviously, there's a lot of uh, immobility with osteopenia. So you have the impingement from the heterotopic ossification plus the hardware in a patient that is osteoporotic because of reduced mobility uh, or immobilization. And so obviously, a significant risk factor for displaced femoral neck fractures. So again, as I mentioned, we've attempted different things historically to reduce the incidence of heterotopic ossification, both from uh, endomethacin and radiation at our institution, we resort to anti-inflammatories. Osteonecrosis of the femoral head, the other dreaded complication. This is a, a classic case where you can see the chronic acetabular fracture where they have done open reduction internal fixation, uh, and you can see the severe post-traumatic osteoarthritis. But the key here is that there is a subchondral, chronic subchondral fracture with articular surface collapse. So this is not a septic joint. This is just a patient that had an acetabular fracture that uh, with risk factor of AVN, developed subchondral fracture from the AVN that collapsed and, and that aggravated the osteoarthritis. So again, the highest risk of AVN are that posterior fracture dislocations where that femoral head remains out for a longer period of time and you have disruption to the artery of the femoral head through the ligaments and teres femoris. Also, if you have concomitant femoral head fractures, the so-called Pipkin fractures, and, and the treatment for this obviously would be a revision. So here's a patient. This is actually a, a somewhat of a sad case because this patient had an undiagnosed uh, posterior acetabular fracture. So he presented uh, with hip pain. They missed the posterior wall fracture. Uh, he had actually had a subluxation. Um, he developed osteonecrosis of the femoral head. They thought it was primary AVN of the femoral head, but it's actually post-traumatic. And then obviously uh, a year later has severe, uh, you know, FICAT4 AVN of the femoral head with osteoarthritis. But again, this was traumatic from a missed posterior wall fracture. Uh, so the rates of post-traumatic DJD vary, but they can be has, as high in the literature to 48%. Here's another example of a missed posterior wall fracture. Uh, this was... Uh, some, the initial read on this was mild degenerative change, but there is a subtle posterior wall fracture there. And this is at four months follow-up. This is rapidly progressing in osteoarthritis. You can see the posterior wall fracture. Uh, they initially thought this was uh, some sort of either septic arthritis or, or you know, some, some unusual uh, TB, you know, delayed onset septic arthritis. But all this was was a missed posterior wall fracture in an osteoporotic patient that had low energy trauma. They missed the posterior wall fracture and presented with incongruity and rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. And so here's that 12-month follow-up, severe post-traumatic array. Here's another patient with chronic instability, obviously a lot of heterotopic bone and non-united fracture fragments with a chronic posterior dislocation uh, and subsequent deformity of the femoral head. So total hip arthroplasty following open reduction internal fixation of acetabular fracture uh, has a much higher failure rate. The orthopedic literature is pretty clear. And what I mean by that is, if you have an acetabular fracture and they did open reduction internal fixation and they were not able to appropriately re reduce or restore the congruity of the articular surface, those patients tend to have a much higher failure rate of hip arthroplasty, which is unfortunate because you're dealing with younger patients. So they'll have a much higher failure rate of the hip arthroplasty uh, they're younger patients, so the arthroplasty has to be there a longer time. They have comp uh, compromised bone quality. You have loss of acetabular bone stock and obviously distorted anatomy. And again, remember that it's not just the osseous anatomy that's been disrupted. You have a lot of soft tissue injuries, so the capsule of the hip will be lax. So we know that if you have a, a, a lot of the capsular envelope, the, 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 the joint capsule and the capsular ligaments around the hip, if they're chronically stretched, uh, because of trauma, when they attempt to do a hip arthroplasty, that arthroplasty is going to have micro instability and lead to premature failure. 
And with that, I'll end. These are my kids and my niece. This is where we are right now. Uh, again, Adam, thank you so very much for the opportunity to lecture. And with that, I'll stop and I'll open the floor for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Jose. That was an excellent talk. Um, looking at, uh, let's see, the questions. And it looks like you've been pretty uh, complete in your lecture because I don't see any questions at this point. So. Um, and I think you covered the, the two questions from uh, the pretest, so um, that may be why uh, we don't have any questions anymore. So um, give it another couple seconds and see if anything comes across. Otherwise, uh, hope everyone has a great morning. Dr. Jose, thank you again so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, everyone. Be safe.